In the video today, we're answering a viewer question because Guy H asks us, who invented bowling? By the late 19th century, archaeologist William Matthews Flinders Petrie, or simply Flinders Petrie, had already established himself as, perhaps, the world's leading Egyptologist. 18 years earlier, at the young age of 24, Petrie had published his work, Inductive Meteorology, or The Recovery of Ancient Measures from the Monuments, in which he detailed measurements of Stonehenge. Using those, he made hypotheses about how, when, and why the strange structures were built by aliens. <laughs> Not really. It was one of the first times any archaeologist had attempted comprehensive measuring with estimated knowledge of historical sun and lunar cycles to establish theories on ancient structures. In 1880, he made his way to Egypt, where he measured and triangulated the Great Pyramids, tombs, and other ancient Egyptian buildings. Those calculations remain the standard that historians use today. Always a man for detail, he also began collecting ancient aliens. <laughs> Always a man for detail, he also began collecting ancient pottery shards found on the floors of the tombs that had previously been disregarded. He catalogued the exact location of these pottery bits, recording every little detail, and began to piece together a history of the ancient Egyptians using said artifacts. In fact, the locals were so impressed with Petri's pottery knowledge that they gave him the Arabic name Abu Bagosher, translating to Father of Pots. What an honor. He was soon hired by the Egyptian Exploration Fund, the EEF, but that marriage only lasted two years due to Petri's controlling personality and criticism of the work that came before him. Said Petri, nothing seems to be done with any uniform or regular plan. Work is begun and left unfinished. No regard is paid to future requirements of exploration, and no civilized or labor-saving devices are used. It is sickening to see the rate at which everything is being destroyed and the little regard paid to preservation. No wonder they ended the collaboration. So, what does any of this have to do with bowling? <laughs> yeah, you're here to watch a video about bowling, not ancient Egypt, but here we go. Welcome to Today I Found Out. For the next 10 years, Petri excavated throughout Egypt and then called Palestine with his own and private funding. During the 1895 field season, not the 1930s as you'll often read, Petri began working on a cemetery site in Nakwada, a town on the west bank of the Nile. He excavated nearly 3,000 graves, all of them filled to the brim with items for the deceased to take with them to the afterlife. Many of them were children's graves in which there were assorted games and toys. As Petri was known to do, he kept extremely detailed notes of what he found, including, as described in his notebook, in a large grave of a child was found a group of stone balls, etc., shown in seven. Their original arrangement is quite unknown, as they were found loose in the earth. The nine vase-shaped stones we thought belonged to a necklace at first, they are cut in alabaster and veined brescia. None of them are pierced for suspension, and they can only stand on their circular flat ends. This leads us to suppose that the nine vase-shaped pieces were to stand on the ends and to played at with the balls, which are just suited in size and weight for such a purpose. Anyway, figure seven that he was referring to shows nine pins, similar to bowling pins, and four marble-sized balls. Yes, it does look a lot like modern-day bowling. So, well, case closed. The ancient Egyptians invented bowling, right? Well, yeah, maybe, but also, well, maybe not. As pointed out by the International Bowling Museum, the notes and figures were actually Petri's interpretation of what he thought he had found. For one, all of these items were found, as admitted by Petri, separate from one another. They may have been in the same grave, but it doesn't mean they were connected in any way besides belonging to the same deceased person. In the end, owing to the lack of much in the way of evidence of the sport elsewhere in ancient Egypt, beyond the items in this grave and a few other instances of heavy porcelain balls presumed to have have been used for rolling rather than throwing due to their weight, it could have been that Petri, along with many others across England and the United States at the time, just had bowling on the brain. After all, that same year, on September the 9th, 1895, in New York City, the first national bowling organization, the American Bowling Congress, was established due to the game's rising popularity. So when did a better documented bowling-like game first pop up in history? Well, many point to Roman soldiers who tossed stone balls at other stone balls, but that game seems much closer to botcher or lawn bowling than actual modern-day bowling, though at least it was a ball-rolling game where the object was to hit certain objects. The International Bowling Museum and the PBA both cite evidence that the game existed in 300 AD Germany when it was used as part of a religious ceremony. According to the PBA, those who could knock down the pins were said to be of good character. Those who missed had to do penance. As for something more for recreation, if bowling's popularity as a game didn't date back to ancient Egypt, it certainly goes back at least 700 years. In 13 
1066, King Edward III outlawed the game because his troops were too busy playing it instead of engaging in archery practice. Fast forwarding to more modern times by 1819, Washington Irvin's Rip Van Winkle drinks the moonshine of men who are playing nine pin. In 1841, a Connecticut law prohibit maintaining nine pin lanes due to its connection to gambling. And as mentioned, by 1895, a national organization was formed to standardize rules and create national competitions. And the rest, as they say, is history. And now for a bonus fact. Ever wonder why bowling three strikes in a row is called a turkey? Well, we hope so, because that's what we're out to talk about. And we kind of need you to keep watching so the algorithm doesn't banish this video to the realm of forgotten YouTube videos. But to go back to the question at hand, this is thought to have its origins in bowling tournament prizes. Late 18th and early 19th century prizes given out during these bowling tournaments were often food items, such as a basket filled with various grocery items, a large ham, or the like. Particularly around Thanksgiving in the United States, turkeys became common prizes. At some point, no one knows the exact first instance, one tournament decided to give away a turkey to people who managed to bowl three strikes in a row. This practice spread and eventually embedded itself in common bowling vernacular long after giving away actual turkeys had stopped. Now at this point you might be wondering how those individuals running tournaments managed to make any money at all when they were giving away a turkey anytime someone bowled three strikes in a row, let alone prizes for other accomplishments. I mean, after all, even complete amateurs can achieve this feat on occasion, and those who are skilled can do it with regularity. But in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, bowling three strikes in a row was extremely hard to do owing to the fact that they didn't have nearly the refined, pristine lanes we're used to today. Further, the pins were set up by hand, sometimes in a not-quite-uniform fashion. Bowling balls also tended to not be well-balanced, and people running the tournaments would use tricks to make the pins harder to knock down, such as adding weights in the bottom of the pins. So at this point, bowling three strikes in a row was exceptionally hard to do, even for those who were highly skilled. Of course, today things are a little different, and with it being somewhat more common to hit three strikes or more in a row, new names have been developed to account for the strike bloat, though usage of these terms isn't nearly as widespread as with turkey. That being said, relatively common terms include four consecutive strikes, a ham bone, six consecutive strikes, wild turkey, nine consecutive strikes, golden turkey, a perfect game, all strikes from start to finish, dinosaur. Supposedly originally because it's non-existent like a dinosaur, though in fact it has been done several times, such as by Grazio Castellano, who was the first to bowl a perfect game on live television on October the 4th, 1953. Further, there are actually animals, Colurosauria theropods, alive today that are dinosaurs, contrary to popular belief. These are from the same subgroup as the T-Rex, including chickens and, funnily enough, turkeys. So think about that the next time you have a McDinosaur sandwich or scramble up some dinosaur eggs for breakfast. And one more bonus fact to round things off today, how the turkey got its name. In the 16th century, when North American turkeys were first introduced en masse to Europe, there was another bird that was popularly imported throughout Europe, and most relevant to this topic, England, and it was called a guinea fowl. The guinea fowl was imported from Madagascar via the Ottoman Empire. The merchants who imported the guinea fowl were thus known as turkey merchants. The guinea fowl eventually were referred to as turkey fowl, similar to how other products imported through the Ottoman Empire acquired their names, such as turkey corn, turkey wheat, etc. The North American turkey was first introduced to Spain in the very early 16th century and popularly introduced to all of Europe shortly thereafter. The animal was thought by many to be a species of the type of guinea fowl that was imported via the Ottoman Empire and thus began also being called a turkey fowl in English, with this eventually being shortened to just turkey. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. Thank you for watching all the way to the end and giving me that sweet, sweet watch time. Smash that like button and I'll see you next time.